Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 23, the word of the Lord says this. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon in the afternoon, the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. May it be a light unto our paths and may, your journey, may our journeys be illuminated through it this time. God, we need your light to guide us. We want to be salt in this world for your glory and for your kingdom. And to that end, I pray that you would use this time to do just that. Mold us and shape us into your instruments, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I knew I'd forget some announcements and stuff like that. It's an informal service. Guys, don't even try and keep the kids down. If you're pinning your, your, you know, your toddler or, or your young one to your chair because you think it reflects poorly on you or something like that, nothing could be further from the truth. The kids need to feel free to run and play and stuff during this time. God will, God will impart to them what he's ready to impart to them on his, on his time. So I'm just letting you know that. Um, it's good to be together, isn't it? We've been waiting a long, long time for this. Ten weeks, eleven weeks, I think it was. And it really happened pretty suddenly. And... Uh, I appreciate you guys coming out today. I appreciate us being willing and able, serving in a church uh, with a wonderful church board that through this time has provided leadership and direction to us. We've just kind of made the best with what we've had, and, and, and we know it's not going to be perfect, and we know this is going to be perfect, but we're going to work together. Because the question I keep asking the church board, and the question I keep asking myself is, what is God trying to teach us through this time? I mean, I have to wonder, look, when I sat down and thought about it in the midst of all this stuff, there's our first loud truck of the day. Awesome. It's not going to be the last one. As I sat down in the midst of all this, I thought, what is God trying to teach us? And, and to be honest with you, let's be honest. We've been doing church the same way as far as we can remember for hundreds of years, right? We have a set time that we show up and we do our service, and that's how we order church. But what if God's trying to move the church in a different direction? And I don't know what that means. I'm not saying he is. I'm not saying he's not. I'm saying, what is God trying to teach us through this? And I think that's a question we should be asking ourselves, and I think that's a question we should be asking ourselves about this scripture today. So I'm going to ask you this. That, 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 is that wind getting a little loud for you? Yeah. Again, we're still dialing in the, the, the vocals and, and the audio here. So hopefully we'll get that. Um, 
question I want to ask you today is this. Does God still speak to us in visions? Does God still speak to us in visions? Because what we have that you can see clear and plain as day is you have two men in this passage, two main characters. you got this guy named Cornelius and this guy named Peter. And they spoke, God spoke to them through visions. I think we can all understand that, that God speaks to us through the Bible. I think we all understand that God speaks to us when we pray. And God speaks to us in our times of solitude, right? God speaks to us through the wisdom and counsel of others that we know and respect, godly men and women. And, and, and look, we've been working through the book of Acts, so hopefully we can understand that he speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. That's just my tune. That's my groove. That's my baseline there. Right? Yeah. But if God speaks to us through a vision, what do we do about it? I mean, if I were to say to somebody, look, God's speaking to me through a prayer. Or God's speaking to me through the meaning of his word or through or counsel of others. You'd all be like, yeah, that's great. But if I came up to you, hey, I really need to tell you something. God spoke to me in a vision last night. You'd be like, all right, Pastor Scott needs to get back on his medication. Right? Like, like it, it, it doesn't happen normal. It's not part of our vernacular. It's not how we tend to operate this day. It comes across a little crazy. But what we're dealt with here in the book of Acts today is Peter had a vision and Cornelius had a vision. So does God still speak to us through visions? Now, I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite all-time sports moments. And maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you've heard it before. You probably didn't. It actually happened in 2009. It was between two teams that I could care less about when it comes to Major League Baseball. The Seattle Mariners and the Toronto Blue Jays. And at the end of September in 2009, with both those teams out of the playoff hunt, Seattle traveled up to play a game in, in, in Toronto, north of the border. And before the game, the announcers for the Seattle Mariners were having their conversation before the game leading in. And they said, who's going to be, they were asking one another, who's going to be your impact player of the game? You know, who's the one player who's going to make an impact? And there was an announcer, this guy's name is Mike Blowers, and here was his response. He says, I think, clearly, it's going to be Tui Asasopo. Now, if you don't know much about baseball, and even if you do know a lot about baseball, you probably haven't heard a lot about Matt Tui Asasopo. His career consisted of five years in the major leagues with three different teams. He was a journeyman catcher at best. But here's what Mike Blowers went on to say before the game that day. He said this. He said, He's swung the bat well the last few times he's gotten the opportunity to play. I expect him to hit his first big league home run today. He's going to get he's going to get in on a good count. He's going to get a fastball from Talon, who's the pitcher, and he's going to hit it out to left center field probably in the second deck. Right? So he's getting specific here. So the other announcement, the other, the other announcer turns to him. And if you're really bored while I'm speaking, you can get on your phone and look up YouTube and you'll find the video to this. It's quite outstanding. The other announcer says, okay, all right, I'm looking forward to it. Matt Tilio Sosopo's first home run of his career coming up according to Mike Blowers. But Blowers didn't stop there. He chimes back in and he says, oh, yeah, by the way, it's going to be on a 3-1 count. And, he, and, 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 and then the other announcement, announcer asked him, he said, well, it's going to be a breaking ball or a fastball. He said, oh, it's going to be a fastball. He said, he's a fastball pitcher. It'll be a fastball. It'll be on a 3-1 count in his second at-bat. And then the announcer said, well, you also said it's in the second deck how many rows back. And he responded by going, well, it's hard to say because people usually reach up and grab at the ball, so you can't tell exactly where it's going to be. Fast forward to about an hour and a half to the fifth inning of the game. Mike Blowers is not sitting in the stand calling the game with the guys at this point. It was just two other guys calling the game. Matt Tuiasasopo comes up. He's got a 2-0 count. The next pitch is a breaking ball on the inside part of the plate for a strike. Two balls and one strike. The next pitch is a fastball that misses just high and inside. The count is now what? Three balls, one strike. His second at-bat of the day. And it's great because you know what the announcer says at this point? He says, I've never been so excited in my life to see a batter with a three balls and one strike count. And then you can see because it's a 3-1 count, they're like, a fastball's coming. Sure enough, the catcher puts the one sign down, bring the heat. You can guess what happens. Right down the middle, Matt Tuiasa Sopo hits his first career major league home run to left field that missed the second deck by about 10 feet. It was the only part of the prediction that Mike Blowers got wrong. The only part. And he called it an hour and a half 
before the game ever even started. And what makes it even more impressive when you look at Matt Tuiasa Sopo's career, as I mentioned, five years, three different teams, he only hit 12 home runs his entire major league career. And in 2009, you know how many home runs he hit all together? One. That day, in that at bat. It's, it, it, you know, and, and I had to look back and wonder, was Blowers just joking around when he made the call? He was like, yeah, hey, why not? Tuyo Sosopo, he's the worst guy we got playing for us today. Let's throw him out as the impact player of the day. You know, it, it, and then it reminded me of the old VW commercial. There was a Super Bowl commercial where the kid dressed up as Darth Vader. Yeah, we're going in and out. Check, check, check. How about now? We good? Yeah, it reminded me of the VW commercial. Just so you know, um, if you remember that commercial where the kid dressed up as Darth Vader and he's going around the house trying to do stuff, that commercial is from 2012. That commercial is eight years old now. Right? But he's dressed up. He's trying to do put the force on stuff, and his dad comes home, and he goes out, and he's trying to put the force on the dad's VW, and he hits the remote start from inside, and the kid jumps back. Like, you, you can explain that. You can explain that, okay, we see the magic behind it happening. We see the dad starting the car. And look, the Blowers thing was just whacked out, and maybe he just got lucky. But we can rationalize these things in our mind. We figure out ways to do that. But what about when God is speaking to us through a vision? What about if God is speaking to us through a dream? Because God spoke to Cornelius and Peter in just that manner. But before we get to Peter, I want to digress to Cornelius. He's the first person that we encounter in this passage. And, and what we need to know about Cornelius is Scripture tells us that he was a God-fearing man. That, that he prayed regularly. His family was devout. They gave to the poor. They did the things. And so when you think about it, you look at it and you go, well, it's no wonder that, that Cornelius was part of this story. His profile fit the build. But then when you look into it, it shouldn't have been Cornelius. And, and what I simply mean by that is Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He was a guard. He commanded about 100 troops underneath him. And what you need to know about Roman centurions is they were actually had to work with the people that they governed to keep the peace. So centurions were chosen very carefully. You did not want a divisive centurion, then you get an uprising of the people, and you'd had to send more troops in to deal with it. Now, the Romans were more than well prepared to do that, but they didn't want to have to. And so they chose wise men to be centurions and people who could get along with others. And that was obviously Cornelius. But still, when we're talking about the life of the early church, we're supposed to be talking about the Christians. We're supposed to be talking about the Jewish people and how they all interacted. And what are we talking about today? A Roman warrior. It shouldn't have been, it shouldn't have been Cornelius. He didn't fit the mold. He didn't make sense. It just didn't add up. And yet God chose to use him because this was not your typical centurion. Right? Cornelius would embody the phrase that we've heard that God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. That was Cornelius in a nutshell. The reason that Peter, sorry, that Cornelius sent for Peter was that God told him to send him, but Peter's going to come and give a message to your family, to you and your family. Now, we have no indication whatsoever that Cornelius even knew who Peter was. We have no indication that they had any previous relationship, so I'm guessing they didn't. And this was way out in left field, and Cornelius was told to send for Peter. So what did he do? He sent for Peter. Can you imagine the anticipation level that Cornelius and his family must have had while they were waiting for Peter and his message to arrive? I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly what it was like. I can fathom a guess, right? I can guess that they were sitting on the edge of their seats, much like you are all right now as I am speaking, anxious to hear what's going to come out of my mouth. Right? Well, maybe not. But close. Amelia Earhart is credited with saying these words. Anticipation, I suppose, sometimes exceeds expectation. Like, I use it like this. I say, you know, the anticipation is actually better than what the act is, usually. If I were living in the house of Cornelius, I'd be pretty excited about what's coming up here. I'd be excited about what Peter had to say, even if I had no idea what hey, Peter had to say. Because what we do know is that this whole thing was done based on faith, based on a vision from an angel of the Lord. Simply because Cornelius was obedient to the vision and the leading of the Spirit in his life. And then we get to Peter. And Peter had a vision from God as well. Technically, he had a vision from Christ. 
And he didn't have just a vision. He had the same vision three times over. And what's really fascinating, what we really need to get into when we look at the vision that Peter was given, is that he had a vision unlike any other that you see. Here's where it's different. The vision that Peter had given him by Christ is completely contradictory to what is written in the Mosaic Law or the Old Testament Scriptures. Have you thought about that? The vision was given to him by, it was referred to in verse 13 as a voice. And, and Peter didn't trust the vision initially, did he? Look at what he says. Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And, and if you look in your Bible, my Bible is a red letter Bible. You know what a red letter Bible is? When Jesus speaks, the letters are in red. And if you read through that passage, the words of Christ himself are written in red. So Peter is not just communicating with an angel. He's not just hearing a voice. He's hearing the voice of Christ. He is communicating with Christ himself. And what Christ is telling him to do is contradictory to what is written in the Old Testament scriptures. Surely not, Lord, Peter says when he's instructed to get up, kill, and eat. But then Jesus responds by saying, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. But Peter responds again, surely not. We are told that this discourse goes on three times in a row. So why is Jesus instructing Peter to do something that is contradictory, that goes against what he knows to be true? Why is he telling him to partake of food that is written as unclean in Old Testament standards? It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, does it? Now, here's the thing. If you think about it on a practical level, most of us probably can break it down. Most of us think of Jesus Christ, and when he came to earth, he came to abolish a lot of the rules and regulations. He came to fulfill the Old Testament law, not to abolish it. Sorry, I misspoke there. Fulfill and not abolish it. So he didn't come to abolish the Old Testament laws. He came to fulfill them. And, and we look at that Jesus had quite a disdain for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. All you got to do is read through Matthew chapter 23 to see that when they took rules and regulations and they held them over people, that Jesus didn't like that. It was contradictory to what he came for. And so we can say, well, maybe this is part of that genre. Maybe this is part of that book where, where people were abusing these laws. But we simply don't have any indication of that. How would people think about Peter if he told them his vision? Can you imagine the pushback that Peter would receive? Can you imagine the response? Whoa, 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 whoa. Peter, hold on. I thought you were a good guy. You actually walked with Jesus. I thought you believed in the Mosaic Law. I thought you believed the Old Testament Scriptures. Do you, do you see where I'm going with this? You see, Peter's receiving a message directly from Christ that contradicted what everybody in his circle knew to be true at the time. And by everybody in his circle, I mean the early church. What traditions... What customs, what rules are you clinging to today that Jesus is ready to release you from? I mean, it's good to be together, isn't it? We've mentioned that. We know that to be true. The last two and a half months were kind of tough. But we still worshiped, didn't we? I mean, look. Our game plan is to worship out here, June, July, and August, three months. And there's going to be a lot of different days. There's going to be days where it's raining. My pages are going to flip all over the place. I put them in the boulder so they don't blow away. So I'm thinking ahead there. You know, I didn't think anything to weigh it down, but we're good. Right, there, there's going to be a lot of different stuff that comes out. But Pastor Scott, what if it starts raining? What are we going to do? Or what if it's spritzing a little bit? Or what if it's kind of in between? We've got regulations and game plans set up for that. But here's the thing. What if it gets really hot? What if it gets humid? I mean, it's easy to come now on a perfect day in early June when we've been away for two and a half months. Are you willing to come when it's a little ugly outside? I don't know. Would you be willing to sit through a soccer game or a baseball game in the same weather? Something to think about. Right? What, what if God is challenging you? What if God's challenging you? Man, i got to dial back here. What, what if God's saying, 
I don't have to meet specifically person to person. I mean, we worshiped online together. That was different. But what if God's saying to you, you don't have to dress a certain way? Because guys, I'll be honest, this is one that I've struggled with my whole life. As a kid, and, and you understand, I know we're all different. We're all, we're all wired differently. I hated dressing up. Right? So every Sunday when we had to dress up to go to church, I never, I never liked it. And, and when I was a kid, we'd go out to Roxbury Holiness Camp. And if you don't know what Roxbury Holiness Camp, it's, it's a Brother in Christ camp meeting that takes place every August, either late July into early August or nine days in August, down near Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, which is a, it's a beautiful thing. But as a kid, when I would go, and this is like some of the earliest memories I've had, not because I thought my parents left me and were never coming back to the children's center to get me and I was bawling my tears out, right? That may have happened. We're not sure. What I remember was watching men and women going to what they call tabernacle, going to the worship service for their time together, and the men wearing three-piece suits. Suits, shoes, shirt, tie, jacket, hat to there. When you get there, you take the hat off. Women wearing dresses. It's not often in my life I've envied women wearing dresses, right? But they weren't wearing comfortable sundresses either, right? We're talking the modest dresses, the long down to the ankles, long sleeve, the whole nine yards. You know what they were doing during service? Sweating. That's what they were doing. Sweating. Because again, it's late July, early August. It's 90 and 95 degrees outside, and it's humid. And I would say, why are they dressed like that? You know what the answer I got was? Because that's what we do. Because it's honoring to God. Every Sunday, Mom, why do I have to dress like this? I hate dressing like this. She wouldn't answer me. You know, it got to the point where eventually you're just like, it's not worth the battle. Just put your clothes on and let's go. And it got to the point where I knew the message enough that I didn't ask anymore. I didn't have to ask anymore. And it was not because my parents gave me an answer that was acceptable for me. It was because I saw the way everybody showed up to church. They showed up like me, dressed up, looking nice. And we all know that no matter what conflicts you have coming to church that day, the conflicts stop once you get out of the car, once you enter the doors of the church. But here's the thing. To this day... I find no specific scriptural context as to why I should dress up for church. Not one. The answer is simply because it's what we do, right? It's how we honor God, if you will. What customs, what traditions, what rules have you been clinging to that Jesus is trying to release you from? Now, I'm going to read a quote. Quotes from a guy named Rich Mullins, one of my favorite Christian artists. I talked about him real quick last week. And he was asked a question. I don't even know the question he was asked, but I know his response. It's in a video before one of his songs called Creed, which is one of my favorite songs. Rich, Rich Mullins, again, this is a bit lengthy. It'll take a minute or two to read through, but listen to what he says. Rich Mullins says, I think there is great joy in real compassion. I don't think that you know joy apart from caring deeply about people. Caring enough about people that you do something. But I have a feeling like if my life is motivated by ambition to leave a legacy, what I'll probably leave as a legacy is ambition. But if my life is motivated by the power of the Spirit in me, if I live in the awareness of the indwelling Christ, if I allow His presence to guide my actions, to guide my motive, motives, those sorts of things, that's the only time that I think we really leave a great legacy. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. My ambition to be a good guy is a fleshly ambition. And when Christ calls us to take up our cross and follow him, a lot of us think that what that means is we're supposed to lay down our vices and we're supposed to cling to virtues. But I think that unless Christ is Lord of our virtues, our virtues become dangerous to us and dangerous to the people around us. I think that when Christ calls us to pick up our cross, what he means is that you must die not only to whatever vices are in your life, which he will eventually kill out, you must also die to whatever virtues are in your life. Your life is not valuable because you are an articulate speaker. Your life is not valuable because you are a generous person. Your life is not valuable because you are any of that. That if we empty ourselves of everything and allow God to be present, then it's no longer us, it's him. Then it's, it becomes a spiritual thing. 
And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And that's when I think Christianity really begins to make sense. This extended quote, in a nutshell, does a good job of what I'm trying to encapsulate here today. Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you living? Are you doing? Are you acting? Are you behaving for God's glory or for yours? And you hear me say that or ask that question constantly, but I want you to think about it. It's not always about the what, but it's almost always about the why. Why? Because I believe it's in the why that real change tends to happen in our lives. Why did you once upon a time make a choice to become a follower of Jesus Christ? Did you do it out of obligation? Well, I'm at a thing. Everybody else is raising their hand and going forward. I guess I should do. Did you do it to keep your parents or your friends happy? Did you do it to stay out of hell? Did you do it because you thought it was the right thing to do? And that's what all good Christian people do eventually. Did you do it because that's what you've been taught, that at some point you've got to do this, so you may as well get it over with? Or did you do it because you were brought to the threshold of faith, because you had an honest, an honest awareness of the depravity of sin in your life. And when you found out about Jesus, you realized that he was the only way. Were, were you cut to the heart through the power of the Holy Spirit to make that decision? You see, when we become aware of our shortcomings and our imperfections, that's when our heart starts to mold and shape into the image of Christ. When we realize that true change is needed. And that's what I'm going to call the magic of faith happens. Because it's about so much more than just staying out of hell. It's about so much more than just going to heaven. It's about so much more than what we see and know now. Because when you do that, that's when Christ comes into your life. That's when the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And the peace that passes understanding starts to work. And you start to realize, all this great stuff, there is no other way I would rather live. Right? It's not just about the staying out of hell. It's about so much more. So much more. We are drawn close to Christ. The blood of Christ covers over the imperfections in our lives and we are drawn close to Him. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, where are you going with this, Pastor Scott? Right? Because I think it's in the uncomfortable that we need to live a lot. Here's what I mean. I've never been one to shelter discussions about faith. I've never been one that's been afraid to, to, to delve into the whys of Christianity. I've always said, you know, as a youth leader, and I'll probably say tonight at the youth leading, my goal as a youth leader, that was when kids graduate from high school, when they're 12th grade and they're getting ready to graduate from high school, that they know what they believe and why they believe it. Because when you get out of high school, you can't just say, I believe this way because I've gone to church my whole life or because my parents believe so. Because as soon as they walk out the door, whether it's to a job or to college or whatever, they're going to hit smack in the face with the reality of the real world. They're going to be confronted with other belief systems. It's not enough for you as a parent to go, well, this is the way we do it in this house, so just buckle up and do it. Because if you do that, I guarantee you, 99.99% chance that when they leave the doors of your house, they are going to turn away from the Christian faith because they've never been introduced to anything else, and they don't know the why. They only know the what. But the same is true in our lives as adults, isn't it? Do we just do things because we've always done them, because it's habit? And that's why I love listening to Rabbi Zacharias, the Christian apologist talk, passed away a week or two ago. He knew the why, and he could articulate the why so well. If God is who he unequivocally states that he is in the word of the scripture, that he is the creator of the universe, that he is, he is Lord of all, that he is lover of our souls, then why wouldn't we want to explore the why? The why is only going to lead us back to him. Yeah, there's going to be stuff blown around, so be it. You guys are downwind. You guys are responsible for being our, our trash catchers over there. Right? If we earnestly seek after him, we're going to find him. It's what Jeremiah, Jeremiah writes. It's what God inspires Jeremiah to write, right? You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, but Pastor Scott, I already know that I know that I know that I know, right? Maybe you've heard this one. It's in the Bible. I believe it. That's it. it says so, right? End of conversation. No more discussion necessary. It's in the Bible. It says so. You know why that's dangerous to me? Because Peter could have said the exact same thing to Jesus Christ here. 
Oh, sorry, it says in Leviticus chapter 11. It says so, it's in the Bible. I'm not changing my mind. I know what I know what I know. And I've been taught it from your son Jesus, right? In a sense, that is what Peter says at first, isn't it? He doesn't say those words, but he says, Surely not, Lord, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And if you really want to get into it, get in your Bible, open up the book of Leviticus to chapter 11. You have 47 wonderfully glorious verses about the purity and impurity of certain foods, right? And that was a bit of an exaggeration when I said glorious verses. It can get a little dry at times, but it is interesting. It is God's law to Moses given to the people about what they should and shouldn't eat. It talks about the hooved animals and the split hooved animals. But it doesn't just stop there. It talks about what fish of the sea are fit for consumption. They had to have scales on. It talks about what birds of the air are fit for consumption. It talks about never eating insects or animals that crawl along the ground. It is very specific about what is and what is not edible. Right? Which is why it's very confusing for Peter when in his vision, Scripture says, he saw heaven open and something like a large sheep being let down by its four corners, and it contains, listen to this, all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And all the hunters are like, word up, right? I know I am kind of too, but right? It's a contradiction in terms from what Peter knew to be true. Jesus told him that he was able to partake of any animal, not just the list found in Leviticus chapter 11. But the vision wasn't to everyone. The vision was to Peter alone. Not everybody would have had this vision. Not everybody would have understood this vision. Peter would have had to explain it to them. And how do you think when he presented this new information to other followers of Christ or those devout Jews that he knew, they would respond to him? Dude's a little wacko. Dude needs to take his medicine. Sliding down the wrong way, going down the wrong trail. Backsliding, that's a good word we like to use in Christian churches, right? They would respond with questioning, maybe with ridicule. Maybe they would call him a heretic. And they would have been justified for doing just that. Peter was a man whose life... His life bears out that he believed deeply in God's truth. But now he was instructed to alter his beliefs regarding a specific instance. And maybe you're really starting to sweat right now going, all right, where is Pastor Scott going with this? And where does he think that we need to alter our beliefs? I ain't going there. I'm not. Because it's not about me telling you. Do you, do you guys get that? A lot of times in messages, I'm not going to say you need to do A, B, and C. I will at times, but that's not my leadership style. Because again, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier. If I'm telling you what to believe, you have no ownership of your faith. You know the what, but you have no idea of the why. So as soon as you leave this parking lot, and I love that we're meeting in a parking lot, you go, well, it was what it was. Let's go back next Sunday and get our fill. But it's about so much more than that, isn't it? We've got to know the why. I wonder if Peter knew the why. Like, put yourself in Peter's place. If, if, Jesus, if Jesus spoke to you through a vision and he told you something that you believed was contradictory, what would you do? And, and maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, it was Jesus who said so, so I would follow him without question, and I would call baloney on that. I think almost each and every one of us would not just follow immediately without question. I think almost each and every one of us would think about it, would be confused, would wonder what is going on, would think, is this really from Christ or is it from somewhere else? Again, it contradicted what he knew to be true. So what did Peter do? Scripture says that Peter contemplated them. Or as Scripture states, he was wondering about the meaning of the vision. And that's where I want to dial in specifically on verse 19. And guys, you're doing a great job, and I don't have much longer to go, so thank you for sticking with me, right? Verse 19 says, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him. I'm going to stop right there, because I think it's very important that we understand that the Spirit spoke to Peter while he was contemplating the vision. Taking time to think taking time to process, taking time to pray, taking time to get into the Word, to read your scriptures. There we go. All right? When there's an issue in our lives, let's be honest, we live in a knee-jerk society, don't we? It is brutally obvious. We live in a knee-jerk, 
instant gratification, social media, side picking society. Just turn on the TV and you're never right no matter which side you pick. Boy, don't you just wish those in leadership in our, in our world, don't you just wish those in leadership in the media would just do that, take a step back, wait a day or two, and then report on something? Wouldn't that be a nice change of pace for once? Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus these words in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's how Paul instructs the Ephesians to live. And that's how God instructs us to live as well. Right? You don't have to raise your hands, but I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you are... I'm not saying like me, but similar to me, in that we don't follow Paul's words to the Ephesians to a T. That we have issues of rage in our lives. Maybe not rage, but we'll settle for anger. That we have issues of, of reacting too quickly, right? And, and, and we do. We want the, the information that we're immediately presented. We're, we're a ready, fire, aim type of society, right? Think about that. But Peter took time to do what? He stepped back. He contemplated and it doesn't say that he was deep in contemplation, he was deep in anything, but I'm guessing he was coming out of this vision, coming out of the stream, going, this doesn't make any sense. Where is God going with this? What am I supposed to do about this? Peter stepped back, and so should we. Again, this is a big issue in his life. And the point I've come back around to full circle right now is this. Do you believe that God still speaks in visions today? When Jesus talked to his followers shortly before he left, he gave them what we call the Great Commission, go into all the world, make disciples of all men, and he finished that up by saying these words, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what would you do if you felt that Jesus was speaking to you in ways that were contradictory to what you knew to be true? It's not an easy concept. It's not an easy line of thought. Hebrews chapter 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Timothy writes that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Jesus says himself in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word, God, your word is truth. So I would say get into the scripture. That's the first place to start. Even though the scripture was antithetical for Peter, in this instance, for us, scripture is the word of God, and scripture is ordained by Christ. So the first thing you need to do is to get into the word of God. And if it contradicts what is written in here, then it's not from Christ. It's simply put not. The word of God is his truth to us. It should be held in reverent respect. Unlike the attire you'll see me wearing this summer. Right? So what do you do when there's a seeming contradiction in your faith? You step back. You take a deep breath. You remove yourself from the chaos and the craziness that surrounds you, and you ask God to speak truth into your life. I would avoid picking sides, because as soon as you pick sides, then you are part of the problem and not listening to God's voice. Do seek out wisdom, godly wisdom and guidance and counsel in your life. But that doesn't mean going to everybody you agree with about every little thing. Guys, the, the, the world is looking for another answer right now. You've got one way and another way. You've got Republican, you've got Democrat. You've got racist, you've got non-racist. You've got black, you've got white. You've got people who believe that COVID is a hype and people who believe it's the most real thing ever. We are separating completely. And what people are looking for, most people aren't on their sides. Most people are looking for a third way. They're looking for Jesus. They just don't know it. They just don't know it. So as a church, it is our job to speak in love and compassion that Paul writes to the Ephesus church about, 
to live in love and compassion, to live with that truth and to let Jesus shine his way. Guys, you're not going to convince the politicians in Washington with this group of people exactly what we want them to do. But you know what? You can make a difference in somebody's life. You can be compassionate. You can be loving. I'm not saying don't try Washington, right? Because it does start with the people. What I'm saying is what are you doing in your sphere of influence to live out this truth? You know, last week, or two weeks ago, I think it was, I used a railroad track example. I said, when God calls you in your life, it's like going down a railroad track, so he can divert you in different ways. But as long as you're moving down the tracks, he can divert you. You know, it, in the railroad jargon, they're, they're, they have um, things called side tracks, branch lines, spurs, areas of the railroad where a train can actually pull off or divert or go to a different spot for a short period of time. And oftentimes they use that if there are two cars on the same track. You see, if two cars are on the same track and you don't divert one, eventually they collide. It's pretty bad. So you divert one for a time. And it gives that train time to rest, time to relax, time to rejuvenate. I'm not going to say the train's seeking after God, but that's what we should do. Take that time in your life to seek after God. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to try and read them with the pages blown around here. It says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars who, whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe, who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Guys, I don't know if God's going to speak to you in a dream. I don't know if God's going to speak to you in a vision. I hope he does. I hope it messes you up. Because when it messes you up, it causes you to go after him. It causes you to get into this book. It causes you to seek him. And not just seek him on a superficial or on a surface level, but to seek him with all your heart. And if you disagree with what I'm saying, that's fine. Get into it. Prove me wrong. Right? Don't just go, well, Pastor Scott said it, I believe it. That's just as bad. You trust me, I know me. You don't want to be taking me at face value. You want to be getting into the Word. I hope that you are challenged by this, in, by this instance in Peter's life. I hope that you are pushed forward. And I hope that God moves us out of our comfort zone and out of our comfort levels as a church body as we strive to seek after Him. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we don't always know why you work the way you do. It's easy for us to look back and see how you've worked through certain circumstances and situations, but in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the moment, we tend to not see you. So God, where we need to just step back from the moment, I pray that we would do that as Peter did. I pray that we would hear from you. I pray that your spirit would be alive within us, that your word would speak to us, that it would be living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, that you would reveal yourself to us. If it's in a dream or a vision, help us to hear and obey. And even if we don't do it immediately, give us the courage and strength to do so ultimately. God, we don't know how and why you work, but we know that you do. So work in our lives, individually and collectively, to mold us, to change us, to shape us into your image in a world that so desperately needs to hear about your son, Jesus. We pray that he would be glorified. We pray that he would be exalted. And we pray that he would be lifted above all. It's only through the cross that we can approach you. And so we are, thank you. We are thankful for the blood of Christ. Probably more so than we let on for the most part. But it can't end with thankfulness. It has to turn into action. May we love others. May we love you. And may you be lifted up and glorified through that. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Guys, thanks so much for coming out today. Uh, if you have any suggestions, please let us know. And maybe it's taking care of the wind moving through my microphone. We'll work on that. Um, we'll probably play with the song selection a little bit this summer. We'll do two songs this week. We might do four or five songs next week. 
We might do hymns one week. We might do worship songs one week. We will have water sitting out in a cooler if it gets really hot outside. Outside of a cooler if it's nice and cool like today. Some of you guys are actually bundling up, right? That's outstanding. But thank you so much for coming out. Feel free to hang out as long as you want. Um, we are going to be doing the same thing next Sunday. If anything changes at any point, we will get on the Facebook page. We will send out emails. We will send out texts. And we will send out calls where necessary. If you're not sure at any point, you can call my cell phone. It's on an old um, bulletin, not on this one. Or you can call the church office, get a hold of us that way. Oh, I forgot to mention there is the offering box over there. If you have an offering, you want to tithe, you can put it in. Thank you so much for your faithful giving through this process. It's just wonderful. I'm done talking. You guys are sick of hearing me talk. Feel free to hang out and chat. I look forward to worshiping together next week. Have a great week, everyone.